Good evening. I'm Andrew Perchuk. I'm the, ooh, I'm getting double sound, I think. I'm the deputy director here at the Getty Research Institute, and I want to welcome you to what I know will be a special night, especially because I don't normally feel or look like Madonna, nor do I get to introduce the world premiere, not the world, the North American premiere of a film, which I'm very excited to do tonight. So we're going to show um, Theaster Gates' film Dance of Malaga. And tonight's program is occasioned both by the fact that Theaster is this year's Getty Research Institute Artist in Residence and by being the keynote event of the GRI Scholars Program Yearly Symposium. So we have just had two spectacular days with fascinating panels addressing the topic of monuments and monumentality from a broad range of historical and cultural perspectives. And we think you will agree that tonight's program will add a unique perspective to that. Following the screening, Theaster and I will sit down and discuss the film, its place in the context of the larger project of which it is a part, and its position in the broader context of his practice. Theaster Gates lives and works in Chicago as an artist and land theorist. His practice includes sculpture, installation, performance, and urban interventions that demonstrate the tremendous potential in economically destabilized communities. His projects attempt to instigate the creation of cultural capital by acting as catalysts for social engagement that leads to political and spatial change. Gates has described his method as, quote, critique through collaboration, often working with architects, researchers, and performers to create works that expand ideas of what a visual braced art practice can be. Theaster has exhibited and performed at the Sprengel Museum Hanover, the Kunstmuseum Basel, the National Gallery of Art, the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Fonda Foundation Prada, Whitechapel Gallery, Punta della Donia, Documenta, and that's only the last couple of years. He was the winner of the Artist Mundi Six Prize and a recipient of the Légion d'Honneur in 2017. This year, or last year, he was awarded the Nasher Prize for Sculpture, as well as the Urban Land Institute J.C. Nichols Prize for Visionaries in Urban Development. The Astor is a professor at the University of Chicago in the Department of Visual Arts and the College and he serves as Senior Advisor for Cultural Innovation and Advisor to the Dean, and is the Director of Artists' Initiatives at the Lunder Institute for American Art at Colby College Museum of Art in Maine. The Astor now has several solo exhibitions running concurrently, including his first solo exhibition in France, titled Amalgam, which is at the Palais de Tokyo, the project explores social histories of migration and interracial relations, using a specific episode in American history as a point of departure, the story of the forced depopulation of the Malaga Island in Maine, and tonight's film, Dance of Malaga, is featured in the exhibition. So please enjoy the film, and then we'll be back up in just a few minutes. Powerful and beautiful film, and a little hard to go straight into um, a conversation. But maybe we could start off by how did you become aware of the story of Malaga Island? Yes, so testing, 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 testing. Hi. So, um, 
I was invited to be in Maine at Colby College and was down there visiting friends who had like a summer house. And uh, we were about to get on a friend's boat and my friend was saying, oh, it's a white guy. Lives in Chicago, his family's from Maine. He says, um, you know, we've been talking about race in Chicago. And he was saying, well, you know, there's this island that was an island of like black fishermen. And uh, in the early 1900s, they were kicked off the island. I was like, oh, that's jacked up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we said nothing else about it. And then we, we went out, got on his boat. We were bumping around. Um, and, you know, we were about to go get some, like, lobster rolls or something. Mm-hmm. He was like, there's that island, Malaga. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, and, and you know, I keep thinking Malaga, Spain. You know, so it's like, man, hmm, that's interesting. You got Malaga, Spain. You got the Moors. You got these black folk who were kicked off. You got these Moors that were eradicated along with the Jews. And I was just thinking about all these things, and I just thought, um, maybe a time, part of the thing that I could think about in Maine, even though I was supposed to be in Maine relaxing, mm-hmm. you know, but maybe this island had something in, in it that was worth talking about. And so we stopped to get lobster rolls, and then we get off the boat, and the first two people I see are these two brothers. Ain't, ain't a lot of brothers in Maine. But one of the brothers was a brother named Daniel, uh, I mean, black person, brothers. (laughs) One of the brothers was a guy named Daniel Minter who was trying to put um, historical markers on the island and was already doing really good kind of community-based work thinking about the island. And so this other thing happened where he was like, well, you know, I've been trying to raise the money to get this thing. And I was like, oh, we should just buy the island. And, it, it, you know, I'm going to, I'll keep talking in terms of monumentality, but, but pretty quickly I realized that there were, there were things that were already happening that were super important. And then there were these other things that I felt my practice could do to just kind of amplify Daniel's work and the work of the, you know, main coastal trust. And, you know, and, and so... Uh, Amalgam, which is my exhibition at Palais de Tokyo, kind of takes the question of uh, racial mixing and hybridity and kind of transfers that to sculpture, but it also looks at the history of race, um, kind of racial mixing in the United States from the perspective of people choosing to love each other, not just masters that were on some bullshit. So I think most of the people, including me, have not seen the... Palais de Tokyo exhibition. So can you describe a little bit, the film uh, is in the context of sculptures and objects that you mm. created and, and talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so maybe, maybe conceptually first, the idea was that um, this really hard history uh, where where poor people were getting together and they were of native background, black, white, you know, kind of poor Irish cats. And then kind of immigrant communities that kind of didn't fit in anywhere else, they would kind of end up on this island that at one point was owned by a black dude. And then um, uh, uh, the McKinney family, which was a, we don't really know their racial, ethnic origin, but let's say they were white-ish you know, Um, and and there's a lot of that, you know, kind of, you know, we're, we're at 19, we're we're at 1905, 1895, 1910, things are palpably uh, mixed and, and understated, you know, and so I, I think that for me, that, that idea that, um, People were called amalgams. It's like, how can I take this, derog- this derogatory term and kind of think about that in the context of 
um, architectural hybridity or ideological hybridity or uh, material hybridity? And, and then could I say, okay, well, what would happen if I uh, were to uh, marry um, Impressionism with James Brown, you know, or if I were to, to kind of think about the Fluxus movement in relationship to um, Obasi or the Black Arts Movement. And, 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 and the truth of my training, which is like I was reading Bauhaus and Andrew Rice and kind of the creator of Black Mountain College, I was reading that stuff sometimes before I was reading James Baldwin or before, you know, before I knew Audre Lorde. And so I was like, well, what if I put these things up against each other? Because it's also the truth of our lives. And, and instead of saying, oh, I had to learn the white man's language, it's like, no, no, actually, let's deal with that. This, and, and what happens when I internalize um, the idea of Black Mountain College and it comes through my body, could, could something else happen? Could the amalgam be more interesting than anything Andrew Rice could have done or Gropius or... I don't know. So, so, so there was one part of the, the conceit, which was, could I make new sculptural forms that were amalgamated? And, and the show kind of moves like that. And then spatially, there, there was actually a... It, Palais de Tokyo is a big space. You know, there's a lot of room to kind of move around. So there were commemorative moments. Like there was an altar um, that, that was about an architectural form that looks like a house with a pretty steep slope. And then, um, and then there was this forest that was representative of the new growth uh, because we think at some point maybe Malaga was deforested so that people could harvest the wood for, for fuel. And then there's this film and all, and all through the space um, I'm, I'm kind of asking questions about what, it, what, what does it mean when we say um, black and brown communities? And sometimes when we say black and brown communities, we're actually also saying, my dad is white. But that's, that's rarely articulated. My mom is white. And so how do you, how do you start to kind of um, indicate the truth of whiteness within this, this broad subject of a, a, of a racial imaginary called brown. Well, I mean, that's one thing, the interesting, we were just talking before, you were saying, because obviously your work is deeply engaged with African-American history from the beginning, but you were saying that there are very few monuments to interracial communities. Yeah, or... It, uh, um, so maybe one thing about the, the, the symposium on monumentality is that from the, from the beginning of being invited to be in residence, um, I was concerned that the monument that was being discussed might only land at material forms, right? And, 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 and there are a lot of really important monuments but I actually now know that the, the intent was much broader than that, and definitely my intent was broader, which is um, how many people know that they're of mixed ethnicity in the audience? Y'all look at each other. Yeah. Right, and that, 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 there was this, that there's something that uh, was kind of understated because we don't actually have a, a sophisticated enough language always to talk about the truth of our identity. And um, maybe, maybe historically, uh, the truth of your biraciality or, or triraciality, the history of your ethnic makeup would be evidenced in the monument of your hair or your freckles or your skin or, um, or maybe mannerisms that you get from your daddy's side because they 
Appalach from the Appalachian white world, and your mama's side is from the sophisticated old school Detroiters or the Philadelphians or something, and that that you end up being this weird mix of like I, you know, <laughs> I can kind of get along with anybody because, you know. <laughs> uh, but 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 is it possible to think of um, not to monumentalize by you know, being biracial, but to, to say race is so much more complicated than the language that we have for it, and the conversations could get so much more interesting um, if there was room for, because of this weird um, white world, this weird world, for a person who identifies as black to talk lovingly about how loving their white mother was, or how loving their white father was, or, or how, uh, how loving their black mother or father was, given the complexity of choosing to continue to live with that white woman in a black neighborhood. And all those things that are just, ooh, harder to talk about, and it's like, I'm just glad I'm brown. And so there's a kind of monument of brownness, and I'm just trying to open that up. <laughs> you know. Well, one of the, what's not clear from the film, mm. but a really interesting and conscious choice you made, is that this is not documentary. It's mm -hmm. a fiction film. You didn't go and track down the descendants of Malaga. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I felt pretty strongly that, um, like let's say if I was doing a certain kind of political work or an activistic work, um, that, that um, it could get journalistic or, you know, And that there were other people who were already committed to that. You know, they were, you know. And, and the thing that was interesting was that, it, you know, this edict was announced in 1911 and 1912. People were, were um, they weren't forcibly removed, really. They left in advance of the force, right? They left. So, the, so it was like the... The announcement came that the governor was kicking you know, folk off the island, and they had like six months, they, were, they left. And it seems like what happened was that there were those who could pass who were white-ish, white enough, and they were able to kind of settle and just kind of be quiet. And then those who couldn't, and then there were those who were sent to an insane asylum yeah. said to be shiftless because they were asked questions like, who's the current president of the United States, and if they answer that wrong, they were thought to be mentally incapable of, of living. When really but that there was, was also, I mean, a way of controlling oh, yeah. communities was to, in those days, put them in. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and controlling the image, because Malaga, you know, imagine this is the island and there's some trees in the middle. And this is a black person standing at the edge of the island. Maine was becoming a kind of uh, an emergent center for tourism, fly fishing, uh, uh, retreat. And so they didn't want boats to have to look at the image of black people or mixed race people from their boats. That, that it would disturb the state's image Right, and, and so and so it was it was it was uh, so that stuff is kind of you know it's just kind of interesting. Yeah, and and so what I, I I just decided okay well rather than making my exhibition uh, about the people of Malaga, I'll take the question of racial mixing, and and then from there start to construct. Um, a, a, a Malagan future, 
right? So in the show, there's this area called the Malaga Department of Tourism. And I, I imagine myself being like the executive director of the Department of Tourism, and I would basically make the island the home for any mixed race person in the world. And that Malaga would have a passport. And so it's like, hey, you know, like, Ghana has this like repatriation situation they want to do. It's like, hey, if you're of mixed descent, any mi- welcome home, right? And, and that there would be a place finally where one doesn't have to feel like a freak because they're, they're mixed, you know? And so the Department of Tourism has these, um, this manifesto. And it, it just moves between, I wouldn't even call it fiction because it ain't, it's not like I'm, it's, I'm not lying. I'm not stretching the truth. I'm just interested in um, how history meets something other than a historian so that history can move in different places. We, we, can, we could start to imagine like these young bodies. I really wanted to have bodies that, you know, to have to survive a winter in Maine on an island in 1905, you kind of had to be a different breed. You know what I mean? You had to be another kind of person to just be like, oh, baby, I have to use the restroom in the winter in Maine. You know, and, and so I, I wanted, I thought these dancers, and I want to acknowledge Kyle Abraham, who's choreographer, of the dance work, who's uh, just one of the coldest people I've ever met. Cold is a good thing. Cold. Mm-hmm. He's not a cold-hearted person. He's a cold-blooded dancer. Let's talk about that a little bit because yeah. so much of your work is about collaboration. Uh-huh. So let's talk about both the the literal collaborations in this project with choreography, with yeah. the editing, mm-hmm. but also House. Almost every major project you've done has been characterized by collaboration. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting to have a kind of an artistic practice that, you know, sometimes sometimes I do I feel more like a producer and uh, a kind of artistic director, you know. And film has a language for that, you know, where you could be a producer or an artistic director. But, but the truth is, in order to get the shots that you need, the edit that you need, the, the volume, the, the commitment to that rumble in the video that's like slightly uncomfortable, I wanted that. <laughs> and I didn't know how to do that by myself. And so, you, you know, so then it means you almost have to be a kind of a linguist, right? Because so much of the work is then like, how do you translate ideas into something that other technicians can help you with, other artists feel comfortable being a part of, like, you know, negotiating with a choreographer to say, you know, can you, can we think, how do we think about this, these movements together? Um, and, and so I ended up like writing short poems or writing, just writing things and talking so that I could then get out of the way of the artist, the dancer. I could get out. And so like trying to create a situation where you you set up the right preconditions so that so that the things that happen, anything could happen, but because the preconditions are tight enough you'll just about get there. And then in the, in the edit, I worked with a group here in LA. They're called Parallax. And my guy Khalil Joseph is one of the partners there. Khalil makes amazing films. Mm-hmm. Y'all know the name Khalil Joseph? Yep. He cool. And so just like, you know, it's, it's one of these moments where there are some things that uh, I don't want any help with in my studio. I make them myself. When you compose the music as well. Yeah, like, uh, you know, those are my lyrics, and I don't need, I don't want help with the 
the, the language that I'm deploying about this move or the emotional intent of the singer, me and Yao Ajiman, this cold-blooded singer who lives in Chicago, who's, he's just my heart. Like, I never thought I'd have a male muse, but yeah, I mean, there it is. Yao is my man. It's like, oh my God, I love you so much. Um, and, so, and so, yeah, so there are some things that I really like to um, play an artistic role. It's not even control. It's just like, that's where uh, my gift is. And then there are other things where it's like, oh, let's, let's, let's try to figure this out. But you were saying earlier, like uh, even um, like trying to get a house built in the city of Chicago or buying some land, you don't do those things alone. It, you know, you need lawyers, you need city council members, you need the mayor, you need the Department of Buildings and Department of Planning. And while I don't always think about them as collaborators in, in the larger project of space and race, they are collaborators. And it, and it requires a certain, um, you know, you have to use your words. And, and again, you, you find just, I found myself, I find myself in, moments where translation becomes really important. Do you, I mean, your work has been very identified with the idea of social practice art, uh, meaning that the, the social engagement and change are as important as the object itself. How do you feel about that term and how would you describe your own practice? Yeah. I've been debating this term, you know, since I heard it the first time, really. Um, and I don't, I don't want to talk about it in a derogatory way here. Um, because I think that, that the term has something to do with what art history needs more than what artists need. I don't know if artists... Lang what language does is it gives it, if you build out a language set, it has the potential to give you permission to live in that language set. Like you can now say social practice artist, and that might mean something to people in this room. I just think it's too narrow for what the practice of an artist might be. Let me say, um, artists are always engaged with publics, have always had moments within their career where something might be more public than another moment. And I, I couldn't profess that my primary goal uh, is people. So it's more reasonable to say, I feel more called by God to care for people than I do called by art to make a social situation. And so it's like, all right, well, if I'm an artist, uh, a byproduct of the work might be uh, I build a building, and the byproduct of that is that people get to come to the building for free. I don't have to make people coming to the building the primary concern. My primary concern is to kill the building, is to nail it so hard that, that people would be compelled by the thing, right? So, so I think in a way, the social practitioner might put people first, which is awesome, mm -hmm. right? But I think that good art gets to be concerned both with the aesthetic potential of a thing, let's say what the bank could look like and feel like, how it flows and moves, and that's never divorced why am I arguing this point about social practitioners? Mm -hmm. Well, part of the reason I'm arguing it is because I think that if a person goes to college and graduates with a degree in social practice, what might they do? What is it, what is it that they're being called to do? Mm -hmm. And... I would say the same thing, like I think a social practitioner without 
an, an aesthetic sensibility is like an engineer without an aesthetic sens sensibility. There's a lot of ways to build a bridge and to, and to kind of get, get, at, get, a, get from one place to another, but it's like, man, it could happen in a really ugly way. Well, in your case, I think it was much more, but I may be wrong, you tell me, much more organic in the sense that you were living and working in South Chicago yeah. and saw an opportunity there to make a difference with your art. Yeah, I mean, man, I, just promise me that after I say this, we're going to go to another question. <laughs> If a kid graduates with an undergraduate degree in journalism, and then they do a master's in whatever you're saying, relational aesthetics, social things, and then that journalist decides that they're gonna take their journalistic, they're, they're gonna bring their skills to social practice, and then they start making um, magazines about the challenges of, um, the Amazon, or people in Mexico, or, and it's like the journalism is always taking them. What I found is there's a lot of missionaries that end up under the banner of social practice. And they're always, you know, like a missionary, they're always somewhere other than their boring suburb or their little enclave or whatever. And I'm like, man, does it ever want, do you ever want to stay at home and interrogate whiteness? Do you ever want to stay at home and talk about the straightening comb? Do you ever want to stay at home? You know, but I, I feel like in some ways, um, art is a big enough word for lots of different kinds of practice. And I think we should fill art up instead of creating all these little tinctures. Just fill, art is big, art is big. Well, switching gears a little bit, I mean, one of the reasons we thought you were such a perfect fit to be uh, an artist in residence at the Research Institute yeah. is because we're very much known for our archives and your practice yeah. is very archival. Mm -hmm. So first, can you talk a little bit about some of the things you've done, like the Black Image Corporation, mm -hmm. but also talk about, in this case, not having that archive mm -hmm. for Dance of Malaga. Yeah. Uh, are there any archivists in the room? Please raise your hand really loud. Uh, hi, don't be afraid. I see one, two. Yeah, okay, a few, good. Um, I want to acknowledge you because I know that what I'm doing is not uh, archiving, right? So... so Let's say I have some collections of things, right? I have some collections. I have some black collections that were owned by other people who collected things and I either bought or was given or negotiated or begged for their stuff. And in the negotiation, like with Linda Johnson Rice, I would say, um, Linda offered me her books. I said, I would love your books. If you give me your books, I'll build a really beautiful building for them. And I built the Stony Island Arts Bank. But the reason that I want to kind of separate the archive from my collections is because my collections are still active, raw material in some cases. I'm still messing with them. I still deploy them in ways. And I would say that, that, that in some ways, archi archivists have said, you're not, you're not an archivist and these aren't archives because um, the set isn't finite, finite. It's not retrievable always. It's a bunch of stuff. And it's slowly working toward a, a rubric of completion. But at completion, I don't know if I'll have the, the anxiety, the, archive, the archivist anxiety of forever, that is, that, that part of the goal is that the thing might live and outlive. And, and so, so, the, so I, I don't know exactly what to call it, but I don't have archive fever. I might have like a, <laughs> I might have a bad cold or like a, you know, 
And, and, and I, but, I, but, I, but, but I do like the, the power of um, organizing everyday things so that people understand the, that, that the preciousness isn't always in the thing. The preciousness is that a society or a nation or a people or a person would care enough to organize it. And, and that, that the way that we understand culture matters is that someone is caring for it. And uh, so the number of people that I run into who say, oh man, I got some old Ebony's and some old Jets in the basement. It's the moment that you decide that they deserve something other than your basement that, that you start to preserve culture. As, as soon as you say, I'm, I'm going to get these out of the basement. I'm going to put them in a sleeve that my grandchildren might know 1953 jet. You know? and, I, and I think that that is what nation building is actually about. It's, it's about finding ways that the minor monuments continue to resonate from granddaddy to, to granddaughter to daughter. And, so on and, so on. and it's, I mean, for those of you who haven't been to Chicago, to the bank building that um, Theaster restored, the library is really the sort of magical center of that, uh, of that installation. Yeah, it, it, feels like a, it feels like a work of art, the, the whole thing. And maybe, maybe I'm also having my own challenges with a kind of definition of terms because it's a building and it's a monument and it's a kind of living work. You know, it's, it's a, the more that I read about the history of land art, the more I think maybe I'm engaged in something like land art and, and that it, it just hap, it happens among others. And so I don't have permission, like Spiral Jetty, I don't, I don't have autonomous permission that, that, that the work is constantly uh, in dialogue and intention with the truth that there are other people around it who deserve to be there and who I'm excited by and some are excited by me, some ain't. And that and that, that work then gets to kind of go through the ringer of people and, and it, it only works uh, when others are there. It only works fully. Well, and what you're saying is really interesting because we think of land art as uh, these white guys going out into the wilderness and with bulldozers and jackhammers and whatever mm. creating. But mm. actually most land art has been urban. If you look at what women and artists of color and others have done, but yours is on a scale that... Um, really does rival the large-scale land art done uh, in the wilderness. Yeah, I mean, well, that, that's back to the amalgam in a way that, that you know, if you, read, if you read about, like, the, the Carnegie libraries or something, or, you know, the, the Sears Roebuck ambition, you know, like, you know, Rosenwald... Those folk were after, or the folk that gave money to, you know, Du Bois or Frederick Douglass to start these early black schools. You realize, like, oh, there was there was there was white generosity at the same time that there was white um, kind of uh, um, monopolies being built. That there there was already this kind of humanitarianism born out of gross capitalism. It was really interesting, the way our nation is built. But I think that if we look at that, those moments of philanthropy, and for me, next to those seemingly heroic moments where uh, um, the Manil family invests in Donald Judd, say, or Dia is born, that it's like, oh, well, what would happen if money met the black imagination in space? And so it's like, oh, if over time Donald Judd got like $26 million from DIA, from the, from the foundation, that's an amazing amount of money for an individual artist 
to do a kind of interesting project. And as a result, he was able to get all his boys, mainly his boys, he was able to get all his boys on. It was like, oh yeah, you know, you get a barrack, you get a barrack, you get two. And, and I think that's really interesting, you know? Um, and so it's like, all right, well, where does $26 million come from? So I'm like, well, maybe, maybe I got to hustle and get my own $26 million so that I can invite my homies into these houses. And, and it is a kind of land art. You know, it is, it is. But maybe also the term land art is no different from the term social practice. It's totally reasonable that when Judd was in New York and wanted to get out, for whatever artistic and seemingly perverted reasons he wanted to be out of New York. That maybe part of that wasn't, it, it, was, it was an extension of the studio. But we have the term land art. And it's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe this is just a big studio practice. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's okay to just have a big studio practice. So it happens that we have a couple buildings, some land. And I'm saying, when I think about like my guy Kevin Beasley, or I think about Sister Stephanie Jemison, I think they're spending their time deepening their work in all these ways. And it just happens that like a portion of my studio time is spent negotiating with the Cook County Land Bank for properties. And, you know, looking at, I don't know what they call it, Zello, or, you know, just look, looking at buildings all the time. Yep. One of my favorite things that you said is that you're interested in making objects that bear witness to their legacies. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, like in the palliative, I've been messing with these African sculptures, these, these masks, they're Ivory Coast, you know, parts of Nigeria, just kind of thinking about them. And these are wooden masks and they're starting to disintegrate. Right? And I keep thinking, man, even with great archivists and great museums, what's the lifespan of the material form that speaks to the fact that black people had divinity and cosmology before Christ was conceived? And, and if these masks go away, and this is back to the monument, will we forget that there was a pantheon of deities? Like, will we ever, will we forget Ifa, or will we forget, you know? And, and so in a way, it's like, all right, well, if, if these wooden things could go away, maybe I could, like, make them in clay, because the clay things don't go away so soon. Maybe I could cast the clay things into bronze, and so I, and it's like, I just don't want us to forget. And it's like, I don't want us only to have the object, but if we don't have the object, what I found is that um, material erasure is a is a is a is a project of war. Mm -hmm. You know, material erasure is a project of war, and so I need the material form to bear witness not to itself, actually, the aster, talking to myself, not to itself. I need material form to bear witness to the fact that it did things beyond itself, that the, that the mask wasn't a mask for a mask's sake. If the mask was just a small iota part of the invisible world that was doing all this other work, that the mask is a, is a clue that there was something else, and I don't want to forget the something else. When talking about not forgetting, you've been involved for quite a while in trying to and you tell me whether monument or not, mm -hmm. but to do a major project in connection with Tamir Rice. Hmm. Yeah, so you guys know Tamir Rice? He was a 12-year-old kid playing in a park in Cleveland. He had a toy gun, and uh, there was a call to the police that there was a kid outside playing with a gun, and the police came and shot Tamir Rice. Killed him. His sister came, they were about to kill her. But um, he died near this gazebo. Um, and P. 
people would go to the gazebo and leave, you know, uh, stuffed animals, candles, visual. They would mourn at the gazebo. The city of Cleveland and the police department had anxiety about black people mourning because they were afraid that that might turn into a mob, right? And so in the governmental anxiety, they were going to just bulldoze the gazebo. So Samaria Rice called me and was like, uh, the city wants to tear down this gazebo. Uh, we don't know how to deconstruct the gazebo, but I don't want them to tear it down. So, you know, my guys got on the road. We drove to Cleveland, got a local team, and we deconstructed the gazebo, numbered it up, packed it up, and brought it back to Chicago. The, the concrete block, you know, like, it's hard to talk. It's like too fresh. But the concrete block where, he, where his body had, had lain, um, we cut, it was cut, and that was part of, you know, so we, we have this material truth that this kid had, had passed. Now, what was also happening at the gazebo was that people were starting to organize around police brutality and unnecessary violence. And it was starting to create intelligence, intelligent organizing. So it wasn't actually that they were afraid of like an emotional mob, they were afraid of a strategic mob, right? They were, they were afraid that the, the death would cause a level of sophistication for which the city of Cleveland was not ready to deal if a class action lawsuit came against the Department of the Police in Cleveland. And so in a way, um, uh, so I received, you know, we, we brought it back, we have it, we're gonna resurrect the gazebo in Chicago. But it's also meant that I now have this relationship with Samaria Rice and her team and, and we ultimately want to find a, a more permanent home for it. So, you know, sometimes these moments, they're, they're, you know, the gazebo is its own uh, reliquary, power figure, a power object. Um, once resurrected, um, the Chicago chapter of Mothers Against Violence and, you know, against police brutality and, um, you know, the Torture Justice Memorial, that there, there are all these people who, again, are much more activistic in their, in their belief, in, in, in their life's work, their vocation, much more than I am. But I happen to be the guy with the ratchet wrench and the, the truck, you know, who could facilitate the management of the material form, even though I'm ill-equipped to deal with the, the truth of the complexity of the violence against, in this case, this young guy. So I, so I'm, I'm trying to really stay in my lane. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we should open it up to your questions. So please, if you have a question for Theaster, we'd be really happy to hear from you. I'm super grateful that all you people came out. <laughs> so nice. It's really good. There we go. It's really nice. Uh, I'm like tearing up about the Tamir Rice. Oh. Um, I'm really triggered. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, as an artist, and I um, do a lot of work like this as well, yeah. not what you're doing. Yeah. Um, how do you emotionally handle that? Like that's such a that's such a even you saying this is still too fresh, yeah. um, but you're you're just talking with so much poise and grace and respect. So how do you, how do you handle that? Because um, as artists, that's our responsibility almost to talk about these hard issues and make people think on it. Um, but also that takes pieces away from us as well. So how do you yeah. um, handle that? Well, I think it's super important that, that maybe this word artist, it may also be too narrow. And maybe, maybe we don't have other words for what we do. So let's say that retrieving the Tamir Rice situation or, or, 
or having to, having to defend um, trying to manage land in a, in a neighborhood of black folk who are really anxious about the idea of gentrification, that in those moments I feel like, do I feel called to be an artist or is the calling actually something else and the word artist is the thing that people most readily understand? And if it's something else, when I'm by myself, if it's something else, then what is that? And I feel like I'm more invested in the something else that has no name than I am in the art. But if we were, to, if we were talking about what the world understands, or, or, then it's like art is that thing where you, you can materialize your, you can, you can, it's, you can materialize something, call it art, and then it has people's attention, and then there's a, there's a constellation of spaces and platforms where if you, you materialize a thing, it lands in that platform. If it lands in that platform, people will understand it as art. But maybe there's all this other stuff for which we don't have a name that, is, that requires the same skills that an artist have and all that, but maybe it has much more to do with the heart or with, uh, with, with some kind of deep, deep emotional intent that has nothing to do with others. So to your question, what do you do with, the, with what it takes from you? Th- that there might be a kind of a set of invisible mechanisms, because it, it's like, My, I'm built for it. I'm built for it. And uh, I don't go around looking for trauma to capture. But then there are just these moments that deserve our attention. And we're either giving our attention to things that matter or we're at the Biennale, you know? And, and, and so I think I just try to balance my time because there are really times that I just want to get on my pottery wheel and just like uh, make a bunch of sake cups and drink a bunch of sake. <laughs> and that's really good. And we should mention, the, you have a background. I mean, you studied ceramics at Iowa State. You, you know yeah. what you're doing there. Yeah, I mean, I like, to make, I like to make pots, but I think that even clay ain't about clay. It's, it's you know, like... You know, for anybody that really loves making clay, after a couple hundred things, you kind of don't need another bowl. <laughs> you know, and I, I got a lot of bowls at home, man. <laughs> I wish I, you know, I could, I, for the next 30, you know, public talks, I could just give everybody a bowl. Like, here's a bowl, you go. Have a, but, I, but I think that, that clay might, you know, that inside of it, it's taught me all these things. I really think I should have been like a, something else. I won't say what it is. It should have been something else. Like, I love that um, the young, it wasn't Dominique Dimonel, one of the, like, you just kind of want to check out of all of this stuff sometimes. And I have a really active commercial art life. And it lives so uh, funnily alongside something else. You know, like, I don't know, you know, but I think that the power that people find in the things, because I leave the things half empty, the civil tapestries, the tar works, they're half empty. They're not done. I think, I think people bring stuff to it. And that's really exciting to me. It's, it's, it's exciting to be an artist plus. <laughs> oh, some, yeah, there's another one back there. Y'all don't be shy. We only, we only have a couple more minutes together. Let's mm. shake it up. Thank you so much. I'm interested in your, if you're interested, sure. telling us a little bit more about the medium of film and your interest in film. Yeah. Okay, right on. So, uh, for me, film and music go together. Um, and... When I, was, when I was making 
clay things alone, I would sometimes say, man, there are so many things that I want to say that the material form doesn't allow me to. But because, because of the discipline of clay, and because it was a kind of discipline and there, there were traditions around it, you, I didn't want to cheat the tradition. When I started doing things outside of clay, I mean, I was always like making poems on the street, you know, like singing songs. But, but clay was a discipline and, 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 you know, all of my big ideas, I would try to make them land through clay. Once I was able to free up from clay to use other materials, I was like, oh, I'm good with a little bit of wood. I'm good at managing people. I could do this little, do this thing. Right. Well, I think I got to a point where there were other things that I wanted to say that were not about um, material things in that way. And that, that there, there may be story um, that would help bridge some of the missing links that people seem to have in my practice. It's like, well, how did you get from singing a song to like making that thing, you know? And, and so film gives me this chance to need other bodies, to need history, to need a song or a sound. And, and film becomes this other site where I could aggregate lots of different ideas and people might imagine them as one idea. So within the film, you actually, you're actually, you have the potential for an exhibition within the film, right? The film becomes the site. Um, and in the way that you guys aren't able to go to Palais de Tokyo, all of a sudden, a, a little bit of Palais de Tokyo could be evidenced. And, and so th if that feels very new for me. Um, so I'm ready, I'm ready to dig deeper into the craft but I don't think that I want to become a film craftsman so that, again, you feel the weight of noir and you, you, you have to have a chase scene and you, you, oh, vertigo, you know, and, you, you know but, but that, that if I could kind of hack, hack in, remain a little bit like uh, an inter, 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 interloper, um, that, that what may happen is that all of these ideas that are really fragments um, of my collection, my collective memory, that then those fragments have a home. And, and if people watch them frame to frame, they're like, oh, got it. And, that, and if anybody wants to help me learn how to make a film. <laughs> I hope you guys like the film. It's really mm. it's the longest thing I ever made. Mm. I'll take two more questions. Yeah. Mm. Uh, have you uh, explored maybe ways of uh, telling a similar story uh, elsewhere in this country or in other parts of the world through the medium of film or, or a different medium that you're interested in? Y yeah. Um, my exhibition, Black Madonna, which was at Kunstmuseum Basel, it, it used the Johnson Publishing Collection as a kind of um, basis for the exhibition. But within Black Madonna, there's a piece that I made called Black Temple, which is Shirley Temple dancing next to Bojangles in The Littlest Rebel. And, and so... <clears throat> There's a scene in the Littlest, the, so it's a series of clips from the Littlest Rebel. One is when Shirley Temple is a sergeant leading a team of young slaves as if they're like a small battalion ready to defeat um, the North. Right? Strange. Mm. <laughs> you know. And then there's a moment where Shirley Temple is dancing uh, trying to raise money to get her father out of jail who's been sacked by the Yankees. Right? And then there's Bo Jangles, this beautiful series of dances where um, Shirley Temple is having a dinner fair. 
she's six. Her friends are between six and 10. And Bojangles, who was serving food, is then uh, doing a little jig in between meals. And he's tapping. And I slow that down, and, it, and, and it's just, and then the, the height of my edit is when Shirley Temple, um, trying to disi- disguise herself as a slave, paints her face black and hides with the slaves when the Yankees actually come and overtake, overtake her, her dad's property. And so they're in a closet, everyone's pulled out, and eventually the northern military soldier realizes that Shirley Temple is in fact not a slave, she's white. And he, And it's just like, and it wasn't, it wasn't the black face, it, it, you know, but like Bojangles taught her like how to dance. Like, like Shirley Temple was like a kind of honorary soul sister. <laughs> and so I just wanted to kind of deal with that idea that Bojangles had deposited blackness in this little girl. And that, 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 pos- that depositing stayed with her through her life of advocacy and lover preferences, <laughs> and so and so, and so and so. I I think that in that sense, um, I'm just interested in slowing film down, and you know. So I I do feel like I, I really like looking at images and looking at archival footage in a way to see if there is something that's redeployable, and then it's like, all right, well. What else do I need to say about the story that requires that I shoot or I direct or I sing? And when you put that together, can you get something? Brother in the middle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Right here. He's really in the middle. Hard to get to. I know, brother, hard to get to. Oh, yeah, there it is. When it, when it comes, it comes in twos, bro. Right no, on. Thank you. Right on. Uh, I just uh, was looking online, and I have uh, unfortunately not seen it in person, but I was wondering if you could share a little bit about uh, your work with the, uh, the bank there in Chicago, the Stony Island Project. Right on. What's your name, man? Greg Lentz. Right on. So uh, in like 2012, this building was going to be torn. I'm bad with years and stuff. Yep. Pardon me. This building was going to be torn down. Maybe it was around 2012. Um, the, the, the legend says um, that, that I had met the mayor uh, of Chicago. He was actually coming to do a ribbon cutting of a, of, a, of a building complex we had finished. He was very happy with the building complex. He said, uh, is there anything I can help you with? I said, this building's about to be torn down. Can you stop them from tearing it down? And he said, well, do you have the money to rehab it if I stop them? I said, yeah, yeah, I got the <laughs> So I was 12. The bank opened probably in around 15, 15. Yeah, that's about right. And basically we have this collection of glass lantern slides from the University of Chicago. It's about 60,000 slides. Um, this guy, Ed Williams, who's a Chinese black, he's, his ethnicity is Chinese black from Mississippi, which is a very particular thing, right? Um, the, the Chinese presence in Mississippi. Um, he became a really important banker in Chicago, was collecting all of this, we call it Negro Bilia to take it out of the market. So whenever he'd go to a thrift store or flea market around the world, he would just buy up all the black stuff. And he ended up with like between 6,000 and 8,000 things. Jolly nigger banks, Aunt Jemima, you know, the, the whole gamut. What, kids eating, what, you know, the whole thing, postcards. So he wanted to leave this as a legacy to his children. His children were like, I don't want my kids growing up with that stuff. And so he just had this collection that didn't have a home. So anyway, the, the bank is basically a repository of other people's stuff. 
and then we try to use it, allow other artists to use it, you know, and, and then maybe also the bank is just a, the demonstration that uh, private black wealth can build a black place and that it's not always dependent upon philanthropy or government and, and that uh, sometimes we should just do the work of rebuilding ourselves and stop asking people to help us do shit. Well, I think that's a, a wonderful <laughs> note to thank Theaster and thank all of you for coming out tonight. <laughs>